And welcome to Friday afternoon at the Manor live with Dr. JJ. Here we gather as we're all waiting for spring to hurry up and get here. We, we want to say that we have to rehire the groundhog because clearly the groundhog uh, didn't do their job and bring spring as fast as it was supposed to. But here we are hearing about heritage past with my very good friend, Victor Carrington. Over to you, Victor. Thank you very much, John Joseph. Uh, welcome everybody to um, Toronto Past. And uh, my name is Victor Carrington. I am the, uh, the host, if you will, of uh, a, a, a social media series called Toronto Past Archive. And uh, I'm a histor Toronto historian, a photographer, and a vintage photo collector. So what we'll be seeing today is a presentation on Toronto, on Toronto's past, you know, spring, uh, springtime in the past and um, events and uh, that we, you know, we used to partake in or we still do. And uh, we'll share some memories of the past and uh, we'll also look at things that we still do today. And uh, these are uh, indicators of uh, the spring that's coming and the, the summer that's just around the corner. And uh, hopefully it'll put a smile on everyone's face. And uh, as we escape the, uh, the, the blistering cold and the, and the, you know, the winter snows. Um, and so I wanted to begin just also by saying that uh, a mixture of the photos are from my private collection. And some of them are also utilized from the Toronto archives as well as the Toronto Public Library and the Ontario Archives. So we start off with uh, a look back into uh, at the past. And first, I just wanted to cover the, the concept of, uh, of, of the use of imagery, which is very heavy in, um, in, in how I present Toronto, uh, Toronto history. Um, and images provide a, a visual record of history. In many cases, postcards, uh, and images such as photographs, they provide insight into life and the pulse at a particular moment in time. So in collecting, one differentiates between whether they're collecting the, the history or are they looking for the story within that history. Most of what I do is so what's called social history. So we look at Toronto as it is viewed from, you know, someone who would have been on the ground at that point in time and how they might have, my interpretation of how they might have experienced it. And that's from reading books, uh, interviews with people. So today's presentation is called Spring to the Past and a, it's, a spring is a time for new beginnings. Uh, the changing season from winter to spring is one that brings the, not only the chirping birds and the budding flowers, uh, the winter sports wrap up and the spring seasons are introduction to the summer season, which you know I'm sure we're all excited about, uh, but it's also a time for new beginnings. Many buildings and events are inaugurated, government plans are put into place and in 2022, uh, in particular, springtime in Ontario will show us the path toward reopening of the province, as well as uh, the provincial elections, which are around the corner. So first things first, we have to get the joke out of the way. We know the number of seasons in Toronto. One of them is construction season, and springtime is the introduction to that, the construction season. So these are two photos from, uh, from my collection um, showing the, uh, uh, the first one is from a from the actually the Toronto Railway Yards down uh, near the waterfront and it's near one of the uh, roundhouses the one that's well it's no longer there it's where the Sky Dome is and um, these are railway workers uh, const railway construction workers and on the bottom right we have a number of construction workers who were building a house which uh, I believe to be probably in the Riverdale neighborhood uh, that's based on uh, using the the back of what is a postcard there. Um, the next thing that we get to do is what, what I call porch sessions is the, you know, the, as, as, it, as things warm up, uh, before there was the television, uh, before, before radio, that's, uh, that's what people did is they, uh, the springtime was the, the, the time of season when they could escape out and finally get out of the house and, and, you know, interact with the neighbors. And uh, that was, you know, the big screen TV, so to speak, was watching the, uh, the neighborhood, uh, the, watching the neighborhood go by. Um, however, now all jokes aside, the real indicator of the spring of springtime in, on, in south, southeastern or southwestern Ontario is the maple syrup harvest. 
and it runs four to six weeks beginning around February to about May, depending on how far north you are. Um, as many will know, the grades of maple syrup run from light to dark and they're obtained by what period of what period of time the sap flows from the tree. So the later the period, uh, the darker the sap. Um, so the, the dark is actually much more limited in supply and it's very thick by the end of the season. I'm, I have a preference for, for dark maple syrup myself, um, but many of us will remember trips to the maple syrup farms and visiting the sugar, uh, sugar shack where they actually made the, uh, the maple syrup. Was, so they would boil down the maple syrup and you can see that in the bottom left. And uh, some might recall on the, on the, on the bottom right, uh, eating, uh, uh, you know, ice and uh, maple syrup or snow and maple syrup together as a, as a treat. Springtime also is a time for where we start with outdoor activities. Um, so here, you know, outdoor life begins in Toronto where, you know, we start to come out of our, uh, out of our, uh, out of our groundhog holes. Uh, on the top left, we have some folks taking the beach on Central Island, which is a little bit more summertime, but granted, you know, it's still representative of the, of the warm, you know, moving into a warmer season. Um, the top right-hand corner is the Humber River. And so the, what's interesting there is that today you won't see this type of activity. There might be some canoeing, but uh, this postcard dates back to about 1905. And the Humber River was once filled with social activities, such as was the Dawn River. Um, in the winter months, you had skating. In the summer months, you had canoeing, kayaking, uh, swimming, fishing. And um, on certain points of the river where it's, it was the lowest, people would even drive their cars and wash them in the summertime. The bottom left is the uh, High Park Mineral Baths. Um, and these were uh, mineral baths that were located along Blur Street on the north side of High Park, near what was once the sanitarium. The, uh, the mineral baths were removed with the construction of the Blur Street subway in the 1970s. Uh, there still is a small remnant of the baths, uh, which is a, a pool, but I believe it's been shut down for quite some time. Um, another springtime event in Toronto is Woodbine Racetrack, which was obviously snow covered throughout the year. And we can see at the bottom right, uh, Woodbine Racetrack, also known as Greenwood Raceway, was built in 1874 as the Woodbine Racecourse. It was originally owned and operated by two men, uh, Party and Howell, who then passed the race, raceway on to Joseph Duggan, the original owner of the land, um, after they were experiencing financial problems. Uh, Duggan actually went on to form the Ontario Jockey Club, in 1881. And that's the organization that would be the catalyst of putting Toronto on uh, the so-called horse racing map. The old Woodbine, which is now a, a neighborhood um, on the, in, the, in Riverdale, which was a nickname it received after the construction of the new facility in 1956. The old Woodbine held the Queen's Plate. And the Queen's Plate, as many know, is Canada's oldest thoroughbred horse race, founded in 1860. Um, and um, it's, uh, you'll notice that every time the royal family would come to Toronto, they would attend the, uh, the Queen's Plate race. Outdoor activities also included um, the steamships. Now, today, we really don't see them anymore. Um, there, there are a few cruise ships that still um, will explore the, uh, the Great Lakes, but the, uh, the era of the steamer ship is, is long gone. However, we have here on the top left, the uh, Corona, uh, the steamer Corona. And the season for the steamships would begin in the springtime. Uh, they ran up until the 1950s and cruising the lakes was uh, a very common pastime. One that would uh, even uh, take overnight cruises, uh, dinner, dancing, and, um, those ships are long gone, but there are a few cruise companies out of Montreal, such as Victory Cruise Lines, which still do overnight cruises throughout the Great Lakes. And if uh, exploring the Great Lakes is something that uh, interests you, it, uh, I've, I've heard it's definitely a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. On the, 
and sorry, on the on the bottom right, we have a postcard from my collection of two young ladies who are clearly enjoying their time on a cruise ship. Uh, they are actually on the steamer Belleville uh, as it was passing near Toronto. So what they had done was they wrote a postcard uh, as they were passing near Toronto. They probably stopped off, uh, stopped in the Toronto port and someone picked up the mail, they posted it. And so that postcard actually has a, a Toronto um, postmark on the back. And the postmark is, if I recall correctly, 1907. Um, on the top right, we have the Trillium Ferry Boat going on its way to Center Island. And the Trillium, uh, even though there's been you know, news about uh, Toronto updating the, the fleet to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to retire these, these old ships, the Trillium itself was built uh, June 18th, 1910. That's when it was inaugurated. And it was actually out of commission in the 1950s uh, to the point where it was actually uh, half sunken in water sitting on the, off the Toronto Island. Efforts by a number of historians and shipbuilders who volunteered their time saw the boat revived and it functions today as a ferrying people back and forth to the islands. So originally the Trillium was built in 1910 and it was retired in 1957, sold for $4,500 to the Toronto Works Department. And they wanted to use it to carry sewage sludge from the Humber River sewage treatment plant. But it was left to sink in a lagoon on the Toronto Islands and forgotten there. Also along with its sister, the, the Bluebell, which was converted into a, a garbage scale. The Trillium was left to deteriorate. Its metal fittings were stripped by scavengers and souvenir hunters. In the 60s, there was a renewed interest in the Trillium, first in 1964, uh, it was proposed to display the Trillium along with other historic boats at the Toronto Marine Museum, which used to be at the CNE, uh, but that proposal didn't go through. In 65, it was proposed to return the boat to service. So partly due to the uh, advocacy of very well-known historian, uh, my, Toronto historian Mike Filey, um, and the Toronto Parks Commissioner, Commissioner Tommy Thompson, Metro Toronto approved her restoration in 1973. Um, and Mike Filey, along with a number of members of uh, actually the, the Toronto Postcard Club and their marine collectors, were involved in, uh, in salvaging and, and renovating the, uh, the, the, the boat. The restoration cost uh, just under a million dollars at the time, which is equivalent to about uh, probably four, and four million dollars today. Um, that was chosen over building a new ferry. And uh, the uh, the engineering firm was actually a, a fellow that, I, that I've met a number of times, Gord Champion. So it was Champion Engineering, and he is a, a very well-known uh, marine uh, image and postcard collector, but also you know, a very well-known engineer, and he supervised the restoration. And so Hanlon's Point is where the, uh, that ship would dock uh, on Central Island. And uh, Hanlon's Point actually opened in 1878 with the construction of Hanlon's Point Hotel. So we have on the bottom uh, Hanlon's Point. We can see a, we have a postcard there showing us Hanlon's Point and the gazebo uh, along the water, the hotel, uh, the um, baseball diamond, which we'll see in a moment. But the hotel and the amusement park were located uh, just further behind this scene. And we'll see that actually from an aerial in the next slide. So here we have an aerial and we can see uh, the, uh, the roller coaster and the baseball diamond. That gazebo that we saw on the waterfront is, is, is right here close to the pier. Um, the main feature aside from the amusement park obviously was the, the baseball stadium. Um, so the Toronto Ferry Company bought what was then called the Toronto Maple Leafs and moved them from the Sunlight Field, which was east of the Dawn uh, to Hanlon's Point, and they built them a new grandstand. The Leafs uh, played there until 1901, and the stadium was destroyed by fire in 1903 and then rebuilt in 1904. But uh, the Maple Leaf Park actually was, uh, Maple Leaf Park replaced the stadium in 1908, and the Maple Leafs returned to play there uh, on, the, on the mainland. 
Hanlon's Point Fire uh, destroyed Gisman Park, the hotel and the stadium in 1909. And uh, by the stadium rebuilt in 1910 uh, had the capacity of 17,000 people, which is quite large for that, uh, for that time. The stadium is notable. Um, so this is actually the stadium on, uh, not on Hanlon's Point, but the Maple Leaf Stadium on the mainland is notable for being the location of Babe, Babe Ruth's first professional home run on September 5th, 1914. Babe Ruth was playing for the visiting Providence Grays and he pitched a one hitter against the Leafs to go along with his three run home run over the right field wall in a 9-0 win for Providence. And a historic plaque commemorates the occasion near Hanlon's, Hanlon's Point Dock. The Maple Leafs left the Toronto Islands for Maple Leafs Stadium after the 1925 season and the airport now covers the land that used to hold the stadium. And so we have examples here of, on the bottom right of uh, a photograph from the uh, Toronto archives showing uh, the interior of the stadium and what it used to look like. And spring also means that the kids can finally get out onto the street and play. Uh, I've included this photo because frankly, it's one of my favorite from the Toronto archives. And these two kids are just adorable. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, the, the, the stick of the bicycle wheel is some, or the tire is a game that, uh, you know, was played, I'm pretty sure up until the 1960s. Um, but I, I, I will stand corrected if, uh, if I need to be. Another one of Toronto's pastimes was the number of uh, amusement parks that we had. And um, there were two in particular. The first one is Sunnyside Amusement Park, which ran from 1922 until 1955. Uh, so it opened in April of 1990, uh, sorry, in 1922. The name Sunnyside was the name of a local farm owned by John George Howard, which was situated just to the north on the location of current St. John's Medical Center. Sunnyside Avenue runs north-south from that location to Howard Park Avenue today. And John Howard's also famous as the original owner of High Park. Um, the amusement park lands themselves were completely created from sand that was dredged from the bottom of the bay and topsoil from a farm in Pickering. Um, the original shoreline was extended into the lake by approximately 100 meters for a distance of about one kilometer. Now, only a small length of the original shoreline and the beach exists today. Uh, they're located between the Boulevard Club and the Canadian Legion Building at the intersection of Dowling and Lakeshore Boulevard. Unfortunately, uh, Sunnyside was demolished in 1955 to facilitate the building of the, uh, the Gardner Expressway. So the Gardner Expressway actually runs where you see these hydro, uh, hydro poles. That is the, almost the exact placement of the Gardner Expressway. So all of this had to be uh, had to be removed as a result of that. And um, in the next slide, we have some images of the pavilion on opening day, and that is a front a front scene. So that's a postcard showing the the opening day ceremonies at the the bathing pavilion, which is still there today. Um, on the top right, we have uh, an image showing a number of bathers, uh, the top right and bottom left. Uh, utilizing the, the lake to, to cool off. And on the bottom right, uh, the pool, which is actually still there, and at the time was the largest heated outdoor pool in, it was the largest heated outdoor pool in America, but may actually have been one of the largest in the world, um, was the, uh, the pool at the, the, the Sunnyside Pool. And um, the pool actually holds 3.4 million liters of water. And it's still there today, but uh, in comparison, it looks very large in these uh, in these vintage images. Uh, today, if you were to see it compared to the size of pools that we're used to seeing, it doesn't um, it doesn't actually look that big, but big for its time, and a very popular spot. The next slide, uh, we have some more images of Sunnyside from the looking south, uh, north towards the park and then west along the, uh, the boulevard. On the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, a French fried potato stand 
And on the bottom right, uh, Miss Toronto pageant, which was actually the first pageant. So the first Miss Toronto pageant was the winner was, and that's, this is a photo from 1926, was Miss Jean Ford Tolmy. Now, the names of the rides at Sunnyside have always kind of intrigued me. Some of them were the Aero Swing, the Auto Ride, the Custer Cars, Derby Racer, uh, the Flyer, which was a roller coaster, Flying Scooters, uh, Funland, which was a fun house, the Gadabout, which there actually is a store uh, on, uh, in, uh, on the east side of Toronto on Queen Street, a vintage store called Gadabout, uh, which were, uh, was a bumper car ride. Um, the Glider, the Looper, uh, Lover's Express, um, and, and, and a number of others. Um, another park from on the other side of Toronto was Scarborough Beach. So in 1906, the Toronto Park Company purchased 17 acres of the then uh, farm that was owned by the O'Connor family south of Queen Street between Ludi and McLean Avenue in the beaches from the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, the Scarborough Beach Park was formally opened on June 1st, 1907 by Mayor Emerson Coatsworth. And it ran from 1907 to 1925. So it had uh, uh, rides, as we can see in the top left and the top right hand corner, I've created uh, a, a visual slideshow of what the, the ride that was called shoot the shoots. And you would start at the very top, it would shoot down and you would skim across the water as, the, uh, as, as, the, as your friends and family looked on. Uh, and you can see in the bottom right-hand side that everyone looks quite excited and, uh, and happy to be, uh, to be safe and sound at the bottom of the ride. But there were also other, uh, other rides such as the uh, Roller coaster, uh, the cyclorama or the velodrome, uh, the tunnel of love, which was a uh, much talked about uh, ride, um, the boardwalk, of course, uh, the band shell, and um, <clears throat> the beachfront. And so here I've got some examples of the band shell and the, uh, the band that was located within the band shell that would entertain the guests. Uh, on the bottom left, we have an example of a photo from the Toronto archives of the beachfront. And on the bottom right is uh, an item that I found at an antique show a number of years ago, which is a, a souvenir, a souvenir photo from Scarborough Beach. And you can see the couple there looks to have had a wonderful day, but maybe they might be a little bit tired by the time they have that photo taken. Um, but what's interesting is that the development of the park was very closely linked to the development of the Toronto Railway Company streetcar, which serviced the area. Uh, and the resort offering 100 attractions, which included a almost a half a kilometer long roller coaster, um, attracted a, you know, an enormous number of people. And at night, thousands would flock towards decorated park. Uh, and we can see actually in this, um, in this sample image, the uh, lit, um, uh, the lit watchtower there. And actually it's, pro sorry, it's a lighthouse. Also professional lacrosse and other sports were played on the athletic grounds and they feature a wooden velodrome. The, um, uh, Merry-Go-Round, which was located there, actually is still around, and it is now located at uh, Disney World in California. Sorry, Disneyland in California. And so, as uh, as was mentioned, it um, unfortunately, you know, the uh, it only ran from 1907 to 1925, but uh, it was uh, seemed to be quite the uh, quite the experience for Toronto uh, for Torontonians. Of course, Ontario Place is uh, something that's a place that's near and dear to a lot of us. And uh, we still have recollections of, of going there as, uh, as children. Uh, I have here a number of postcards of Ontario Place. And if you didn't know, the venue is actually located on 
three artificial landscaped islands. It opened on, uh, in May of 1971, and it operated as a theme park uh, centered around Ontario themes and family attractions until about 2012. It's been reopened as a park, but um, without several of the large uh, attractions that were, uh, were, you know, were there back, back in the day, so to speak. But the government is currently considering further redevelopment of the site. Thankfully, uh, uh, condos and casinos will not be part of the uh, part of the redevelopment plans, and it will be redeveloped into a uh, into a park. Um, it's still functioning as the still functioning are the concert stage. Uh, thankfully, the Cinesphere, which has the first IMAX, uh, uh, the first IMAX theater, the new Trillium Park, and the William Davis Trail, as well as the Marina. So construction started in 1969 and uh, took two years until Ontario Place opened up in 71. Uh, the Children's Village was opened up in 1972. Initially, the, the estimated cost was 13 million, but the cost ended up being uh, closer to 29 million, which as of four years ago, the estimate was about that 29 million was equal to about $185 million. But many of us will remember the Children's Village, which opened up in 1972 and cost uh, just shy of a million dollars on the East Island. And it was two acres with about 21 activities for kids, including slides, uh, foam swamp, uh, foam pieces, uh, bouncy castles, uh, all types of things. And I remember going there as a child. Half of the village was covered by a 40,000 square feet bright vinyl orange uh, vinyl canopy. Uh, which enabled us to play in the rain. And uh, much to, uh, to my mom's delight because I left her alone for a little bit of time and didn't drive her crazy. Um, <clears throat> the marina was included in the project and held up to, uh, it still actually holds up to 292 boats. There was originally some controversy about having a public facility with an upscale boating dock, but uh, the boats seem to have uh, won the argument, and they're still there today. <coughs> the IMAX and the Cinesphere. IMAX was introduced in Expo uh, 70 in Osaka, Japan, and uh, that's where the technology was first exhibited. And it was a wonderful, a wonderful success. So they decided to build an IMAX theater, and Ontario Place was chosen. Um, the Cinesphere has 800 seats. Um, it's an 800 seat theater and it's still functioning. And uh, it is a 61 foot, 19 meter outer radius with a 56 foot inner radius. And it's supported by uh, prefab steel aluminum alloy tubes. It's actually an award winning design um, for the International Committee for Documentation and Conservation of Buildings of the Modern Movement. Uh, the also the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, uh, the National Trust, um, and the American Society of Landscape Architects have all given it awards. Um, it was actually de declared a cultural heritage landscape by the province in 2014. So a, we are uh, we're stuck with it, which is a good thing. I, I'm a big fan of it. And if, you've, if you haven't seen a movie there, it is definitely worth, uh, worth the experience. Um, also memorable was the Ontario Place Forum, which has now been replaced um, by the current amphitheater. I believe it's the Budweiser Amphitheater. Um, the Forum Theater had 3,000 uh, seats, if you will, um, and additional grass seats as well, a grass seating area. Uh, the roof structure was a hyperbolic par paraboloid positioned on cement bastions, and it covered, 68, covered a 68-foot revolving stage which had 360 degree sight lines. Um, while only having half the seating capacity of the current amphitheater, it actually arguably had better sound, but better acoustics. Um, it offered bench seating and offered a far more intimate theater in the, you know, in the round experience uh, because of that rotating stage. Uh, featured events included the annual Toronto Symphony rendition of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, complete with the firing of guns, guns from the uh, nearby HMCS Haida, which the Haida is now, has been relocated to Hamilton. 
so some of the famous acts that have been uh, that have graced the stage uh, were BB King, Glenn Campbell, um, Kenny Rogers, Johnny Cash, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, James Brown, Canadian acts such as Lighthouse, Ruth Coburn, The Nylons. Um, now, unfortunately, in 1981, due to a riot by fans of the band Teenage Head, a riot which was purportedly instigated by their manager, who uh, had started started it as a publicity stunt, hard rock acts were banned from the, from the venue. Um, but you know, in the summer of 1983, the forum was actually ahead of the curve uh, in allowing young uh, musicians and acts such as Paul Young and Tina Turner before um, they had, you know, they had their huge comebacks. So Toronto was first to see them and then they had their, their big comebacks uh, in the United States. Uh, the forum was torn down at the end of the 1994 season and was replaced with the current Budweiser stage. Now, I'm sure we've all seen the High Park Zoo and we are going to see, uh, we'll take a look at the High Park Zoo, but also, the precursor to the Metro Toronto Zoo. Um, the, in, in eight, the High Park Zoo was actually in 1836, John George Howard purchased a uh, 160 acre property in the County of York in West Toronto. And he actually purchased it for a sheep farm at the cost of $1,000. Howard designed and built Colborne Lodge, which is a Regency style cottage. And he built that in 1837 as a residence for him and his wife. After a successful career as an architect, engineer, and a land surveyor for the city of Toronto, he retired there in 1855. And in 1873, Howard and his wife agreed to convey their country property of 120 acres to the city of Toronto. And the practice of keeping animals in the park, which originated in 1893 with keeping deer. So part of the conveyance of the farm was that one, it would be used as a park, and two, it would also have an outdoor, um, you know, facility for housing animals, which, you know, we we can call a zoo, but the zoo keeps American bison, Barbary sheep, capybaras, emus, highland cattle, llamas, um, peacocks, reindeer, wallabies, yaks, uh, and they have them all in eleven paddocks. The zoo is open year round from seven a.m. until dusk, on weekends from March to October. And the llama pen is open for visitors to feed and pet the llamas. This was in the past. I don't know about now. Um, you would have to check for that. Uh, but chickens and rabbits are also kept for children to interact with. Again, uh, this is something that has been around in the past, but may not actually be uh, uh, possible during uh, these times. But I'm sure we'll be back in the future. Uh, but the zoo animals are cared for by the Toronto Parks and High Park Zoo volunteers. And the budget of the zoo is actually partially paid for by volunteer donations. So if you'll notice that as you walk well, up or down uh, through the zoo, you'll notice donation boxes. So the donations that you make there go directly to fund the zoo. So I would encourage um, if you are in the park and you do visit the animals, to leave a few dollars uh, to keep the, uh, the High Park Zoo going. Um, next is the Riverdale Zoo. And today you will actually notice Riverdale Farm. Uh, it used to be the city's premier animal watching institution. For 75 years, Riverdale Zoo was home <coughs> sorry, to bizarre menagerie of wild and exotic creatures, including elephants, hippopotamuses, monkeys, and sea lions. The historic Cabbage Town attraction closed for good and was partially demolished when the Metro Zoo opened in 1975, and many of the animals were transferred from the Riverdale Zoo to the Metro Toronto Zoo. The original property actually belonged to Henry Scadding, and it was purchased by the city when it opened uh, 162 acres. Um, in 1894, it opened up the zoo on 162 acres with its first residence, two wolves in the herd of deer, which were kept apart, otherwise, the deer might not exist. The collection grew that by 1902, the inventory at Riverdale included 16 pheasants, two ocelots, a male camel, a dromedary, 
a bull buffalo, six pens of monkeys, a Siberian bear, a crane, lions, and a hippopotamus. And so you can see in the top left-hand corner, uh, the crowds are gathering around the, uh, the elephant enclosure. Uh, on the top right is the, the polar bear. The bottom left, um, a very cute monkey. And on the bottom right, uh, a somewhat tired and unhappy lion. Um, the zoo actually attracted uh, 20,000 visitors uh, in its first weekend uh, that the elephants and lions were on display. So you can think of the, you know, the population of Toronto at the time, uh, you know, probably I would say about one tenth of the population, if not larger than that, was attracted just to the zoo in that one weekend, which is uh, quite a quite a feat. Later on in the years, the uh, springtime also signified the Young Street Pedestrian Mall, which was uh, we don't have it today. It's supposedly supposed to make a return. That is the, the rumor. But these are photos from the 1970s from the Toronto archives showing the pedestrian mall, which was actually a resounding success. And what they did is they closed off Young Street um, in the summer of 1971. It was a public spacing experiment. And the city of Toronto closed off Young Street to vehicular traffic. And they opened it up and made it pedestrian only. So what happened is restaurants and cafes were able to extend their, um, their spaces out into the sidewalk, actually into the street. Uh, so you had open air cafes, street musicians, independent vendors. Um, but under Mayor Crombie, David Crombie's municipal government, city council expressed concern with the lack of open spaces inside the core. And that was one of the results uh, of, this, of this project. It was a summer only space, premiered for two weeks in 71 and expanded to 11 weeks in 72 and 73 and then eight weeks in 1974. Generally, it was the 1.3 kilometer stretch between Wellington Street and Girard. And each major intersection was enabled with a east-west traffic, uh, enabled east-west traffic to still cross. But um, a claim for the mall was emphatic in 1971. The project found in their year-by-year -year survey that 78% 78 propri 78 of proprietors along the corridor rated it for good business. The problem was by 1973, all the pedestrian traffic and a lack of policing would re resulted in public intoxication, panhandling, prostitution, uh, leafletting for sex related activity and such. So David Crombie's office closed it down in 1974. Um, another pastime was a, maple, a team by the name of the Maple Leafs, a winning team, but it was a baseball team. Uh, our Maple Leafs were, you know, our hockey team was a winning team up until 1967. Um, but the, the baseball team played out of uh, the stadium at Hanlon's Point and then later on on the, uh, the mainland. So this stadium that I'm showing you here is the one that was on the mainland. And you'll notice the Tip Top Taylor's building. So actually the site where the stadium was is now a townhouse complex which is right next door to Tip Top Taylor's. It opened, on, uh, it opened in 1914. And this is where Babe Ruth hit his home run from. It was torn down in the 1960s and the Toronto Maple Leafs were moved to Louisville after 1967. Um, it's now, as I mentioned, Toronto Public Housing Complex. Another spring pastime is the Toronto Blue Jays. And, you know, the, the historic exhibition stadium on opening day was actually opened in the springtime, despite all the snow. Um, and so the, the Jays actually had their first game uh, with 44,649 fans in attendance. Uh, they played the White Sox. And um, unfortunately, I have a video clip. I don't believe we have enough time. Um, to, to view that today, but um, I'll be happy to include it on a, on a subsequent presentation. Um, but, you know, the, the White Sox and the Jays played a series, and uh, that was our first exposure to the Toronto Blue Jays, which now call the uh, Sky Dome home, which as well has been slated for uh, potential redevelopment. 
So a lot has uh, is, is changing in Toronto. But another pastime was the drive-in theater, which is actually making a comeback. Uh, the first drive-in theaters were found in, uh, in New Mexico in 1915. Um, and they gained popularity between 1921 and the 1930s. And by the 1930s to 1940s, they had increased so massively in popularity um, that it was something that you know you would have gala openings for. So our uh, drive, there was a, a drive-through theater, the Scarborough Drive-in Drive-in Theater, had a gala opening in June 19th, 1952. That's how popular these theaters were. Uh, it was actually had the biggest screen in Canada, and it had a park for kids. It had a, a swimming pool. Um, and there were a number of them throughout Toronto. The 400 drive-in was a popular one. The uh, twin screen, the Dufferin twin screen drive-in, which actually had a swimming pool. I'd be curious to know if anybody actually uh, swam in that swimming pool. Um, located in Markham, just outside of Toronto, uh, was one of the larger ones the Parkway Drive-In. And that brings our look at springtime past to an end. I do have a few additional slides if we have time, um, which are a depiction of memories of Toronto by a, a very well-known uh, Toronto author and historian, Doug Taylor. Um, but in the meantime, I'll uh, leave you with my information and um, links to uh, social media. So if you go to torontopass.com, on the top right-hand corner, you have links to the various social media platforms. And um, we are actually currently working on um, uh, a mini miniature documentary, which will be uh, coming out in the next few months. And uh, we're excited about that, or I'm excited about that. And um, that is Toronto Pass Springtime. Well, thank you, Victor. That was absolutely amazing. Now, bravo, bravo, yes. And I'm amazed at all the, the, the amusement parks we used to have and we got rid of them. What a shame. And it is. My mother used to tell me about Sunnyside Amusement Park. And really, I guess the main reason we got rid of it was because the Gardner Expressway. Yeah. And, and you think of, Mimico New Toronto Long Branch, as I recall, they were actually the cottage country of Toronto. It's hard to imagine cottage country being that far away. Yeah, so did you know, here's a fun fact, that the Massey Center for Women was actually a country home, one of them, for the Massey family on Broderick. So that must have been a, an area unto itself at one time too. And of course, then the... Um, the Don River, as you point out, where people are swimming and doing things. And mm -hmm. yes, but we have questions. I see Michael Lynch and Judy Gasper and Amir and Debbie. And Michael, well, thank you for joining us. Have, how did I, you hear? My, 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 Michael is my uh, my in, invite. He's uh, he's actually Michael is working on uh, on the documentary with me. Oh, wonderful! Okay, so, great. Okay, he's, he's going to yeah. hide his camera because he's uh, he, he's okay. at home. Yes, I'm at home sick. So I'm like, camera. I'm homesick. <laughs> but yeah, it was great. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. So, um, De Debbie or Judy or Mir, do you have any questions? No, you no questions. What about you, no, Judy? It was really it was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, what 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 I am going to do is I'm going to summarize the. Uh, there is a a portion of the presentation that uh, that we didn't uh, that we that we missed. Uh, just due to timing. And so it is a look back by Doug Taylor. And so what I'm going to do is probably record that and, uh, and post it on, uh, on the social media channel so everyone can see it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, truly a, a great time. And look for, actually, Victor, would you be open to maybe doing a walking tour? I think that would be an interesting piece because as I live in Cabbage Town myself, so even if you started with the Cabbage Town neighborhood as a sort of tight beginning, would that be something that might be a, a that's just yeah, in Cabbage Town yeah. itself could take about half an hour, an hour, if not more. Yes. 
Yeah, that's definitely, I've done walking tours. I've done tours in the past. I used to do, uh, I used to volunteer with the ROM. So uh, yeah, we Maybe. ROM walks. And um, I volunteered with them for a number of years. So it's something that I've definitely thought of. Just, you know, with the amount of, uh, it just takes time. Um, I have a number of walks written already. It just uh, require, you know, now that things are opening up again, it might be uh, time to try it out this summer. Yes, well, we'll, we'll certainly uh, throw that out to people as a, as a possibility. Well, Victor, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And, and next week on the, the roster, we have uh, Joel Fendelman, who's actually a Toronto-based Toronto Toronto producer and film creator. And he said one of his recent films is Fireman. So we're going to hear about all the works he's been doing and creating. So may, may spring continue to uh, bloom. And here, here at the manor, we have actually tulips that are probably about 30 centimeters tall and crocuses are coming and tulips as well. So and get outside and have a great walk and, and enjoy the rest of Friday. Thank you for coming. Take care. Bye-bye.